Hello, hello, and welcome again to another broadcast of a Beatles program that we call Things We Said Today. This is a program that we run every single week, centering on what's going on in the world of the Beatles. What's going on news-wise in the world of the Beatles. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the co-hosts of the show, best known for my syndicated radio show called Every Little Thing, being joined by my co-host, Mr. Beatles Examiner, Mr. Monkey's Examiner, Mr. Goldmine Writer, and probably many more other titles that we just don't have enough time to get to here on the show. <laughs> Steve Marinucci. Hello, Ken. Hello, everyone. This has been an amazing day, uh, which we will discuss in a few minutes, but yes, well, it has. So our it's listeners know we record this show on Wednesdays, and it just so happens, and I've told Steve this, it seems like news breaks more on a Wednesday than any other day of the week. Which is really strange, because normally when I was back in the newspaper business, everything would happen on Monday. But not with, not with the Beatles, for some odd reason. We should talk to some publicists that we know and, and find mm-hmm. out if, uh, if there's something going on with that day of the week. Maybe it's a slow day, and it's, it's really uh, advisable to break news on that day. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's crazy. But anyway, we have a few uh, news items to get to. But before we do that, I thought that um, since one of the major events, no doubt what will be a major event, and maybe the biggest event for you as a Beatle fan this year, will be the Mark Lewison book coming out, which is due out in the United States October the 29th, called All These Years. It's volume one of three. It's supposed to be the most exhaustive Beatles biography ever, or as Mark called it in my interview with him, the be-all and end-all of Beatles biographies, and it takes you all the way to the end of 1962. And the first volume is called Tune In. And a while back, I played a little bit of uh, the interview that I did with Mark, and we're both hoping, Steve and I, to interview Mark when the book comes out, in addition to feeling privileged that I've already interviewed Mark already. But um, this is a clip that I haven't aired uh, on this show, and in fact... Most of the interview with Mark is on my website now, KenMichaelsRadio.com. Everything except this clip that I'm going to play. The reason why I held off putting it on my website is because it really is something more specialized about the book. There's actually two versions coming out of the first volume. Again, it's called Tune In. The first volume is called Tune In. And there's sort of like what you might want to call a deluxe edition, what Mark refers to as an author's cut. But um, I thought we'd play that clip and then talk about that and get to a few news items that we just heard about today. All right, so you ready, Steve? I'm ready. Here's more of my conversation with Mark Lewison. Mark, your uh, new book, the first volume, will have two different editions coming out. Why don't you tell us about that? Okay. um, The series is called All These Years, and the first volume is called Tune In. But it's coming out in two different editions. It's coming out in the UK and the US in what we're calling a a trade edition, a mass market edition, which will be pretty big, um, about a thousand pages, Mm. give or take a few. But it's also coming out in an un, not, I wouldn't say unedited, but in its full glory, if you like, um, as an unabridged book of about 2000 pages. Wow. <laughs> and that's only coming out at the present time in the UK. Uh, the US publisher Crown uh, may pick it up at some point, but they're not doing it in 2013. So for the time being, the author's cut, as I call it, something like a director's cut of a DVD, the author's cut of this book is only going to be available from the UK. But of course, these days, with the internet, anything that's available in any country is orderable mm-hmm. wherever. So it will be, you know, people will be able to import it fairly easily. Why was there a need for there to be that drastic a difference between 1,000 pages and 2,000 pages? I mean, that's, that's huge. Well, we talked earlier about when was the book due and did, it, you know, did I miss the deadline and all that kind of thing. The contract for this book specified the number of words that it should be, which is um, for each of the three volumes, 250,000 words. Now, not many people 
out there who aren't in publishing know what that means. 250,000 words is already a very big book in terms of biography. Mm. Um, probably about mm, 700 pages, something like that. So that was the target that I would write that. I spent several years doing all the research, then I started to write it, and after I'd written a couple of the chapters, I thought, hmm, how many words have I written so far? And I checked, and you know, with a click of a mouse, there's the word count, and I gulped, and I realized right at that very outset that I, if I carried on going as I was, I would be writing too many words. But I just thought, well, I'm going to write what I feel needs to be written. That's what this project is about. It's about writing this story and getting it right. Not there's no indulgence in there in the sense that I'm not there's not reams and reams of stuff that isn't of interest. I keep it tight to what's interesting. I keep it very relevant, but mm. at the same time I do say everything that I feel needs to be said in order for the Beatles to be properly understood. So I carried on writing, and at the end of the book, I found that I'd written 780,000 words. <laughs> and um, obviously I had a problem. We all had a problem. Mm. My UK publisher had a problem. My US publisher had a problem. I had a problem. To their credit, when they read, my publishers read the 780,000 words, they said, this is fantastic. This is, this is, you've, you've written what you wanted to write, and we're very happy with it. But we do still want the 250,000 word edition. Mm. So at that point, suddenly we've got two pieces of products. We've got the uncut version, right. which the UK publisher in particular committed to publishing. So they're publishing that, the author's cut, it's coming out, about 2,000 pages of text. At probably about two to three times the price, it'll be about 80 something pounds, which will be about $120 maybe, something like that, mm -hmm. it's hard to be sure. Or the, the market will decide what the value is on that one. I'm not actually sure what the price will be. But I still had to create the other product, the mass market product, the trade edition. So I then had to abridge the full version down to the other version. I spent the first three months of this year doing that. That's could, the toughest part of the job. For me, editing, editing yeah. anything, editing yeah. an interview, it's like when you, when you have information that you think is really just so useful and maybe stuff that hasn't even been said, mm. you know, it's very tough to take that out. Oh, very, <laughs> very. And, and I, I do liken the book to a tapestry because it's all these people and places and things that are happening all at the same time and weaving in and, in and out of each other's lives and so on. The moment you cut something like that, you've got a hole. Mm. And you've, you know, it has to be stitched back together, hopefully in such a way that the hole is not apparent. And that was very tricky, but I did achieve it. But I didn't get it down to 250. The including end notes and footnotes, the mass market edition is about 390, 400,000 words. Mm. So that's still very big. That's going to be about a thousand pages. So it's a thousand pages and a two thousand pages or thereabouts edition. They'll be out. Well, October for the, the edited version, the abridged version, and November for the author's cut. Okay. Mm. Great. Well, I'm looking forward to both. <laughs> yeah, they, they both yeah. work. They, they, yeah. both, they both do work. But obviously, the full version is, 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 is the full story. Right. And the other one is elements of depth. Certain perspectives are, are, are obviously missing from it. But right. you, you wouldn't read it and think there was something missing from it. It's, it's been very tightly sewn up again um, so there's no apparent holes but actually when you read the full author's cut you'll see there are more levels to it okay well, I'm looking forward to it I'm gonna to have to get the the author's cut yes, you <laughs> I'll only be Thank happy you. with that <laughs> good that's that's the that's the very thing I was hoping you'd say okay yeah. and uh, there you go that's uh, my clip there with Mark Lewison and uh, just letting you know what that other version of the book the full version, the author's cut, will be like two thousand pages. That's gonna be that's gonna be sweet. That's gonna be very very nice, very nice. I was telling Steve before we started this show that I happen to be a slow reader, <laughs> and so I'm gonna I'm gonna try to have the whole month of October to read this book. You know, I certainly would like to read every single word. I'm not somebody that likes to skim through, especially if it's something this important. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm really looking forward to it. 
And Mark is someone that I've known now since he put out his first book, which was called The Beatles Live, which documented all the live performances the Beatles did. Right. Going back to the Quarrymen days. Sure. Up through Candlestick Park. He did a tremendous amount of work on that. He told me it took seven years of research for that alone. And he's just someone that I admire so greatly because he's someone that has integrity. And he's not the type of person. I've become more and more less tolerant of Beatle books that come out where there's information there that you've never heard before, but a lot of it hasn't been verified. When Mark puts out a book, you know, he really digs deep. He does the research. He even said in the interview that we played here on the show that you strive for perfection, knowing you're probably not going to achieve it, but unless you try to strive for it, you'll never get anywhere close to it. Right. So that's what he does in the work, I, in all the work that he does. That's definitely been one of his hallmarks. That you know, he's he's just been such an amazing author. And uh, I mean, the the recording sessions book is um, is such an amazing is an is an amazing piece of work. Now, you know, all that's going to be incorporated in the new book anyway. So right, it's going to be you know, it's going to be very nice. Well, the the complete Beatles Chronicle covered the Beatles recording sessions too, mm-hmm. and mixed that with the Beatles Live, and had their their videos, right. their movies, their radio appearances, all that put together in a chronology. There, yep. that's an amazing book to itself. Yep, it's gonna be it's gonna be a lot of fun, a lot a lot of fun. So today, as we were just uh, talking about before at the very beginning of the show, there was some news that that broke. Uh, one of which is concerning Paul's new album. Why don't you tell the folks what you uncovered? Steve? Well, um, and I just got a, I just got a, as we're sitting here, I just got a, a little note about it too. So, but, but, uh, somebody from the, from, a, a, an online site, and I'm talking about a, a, an actual a newspaper and I'm calling, I'm looking at it now, eastvillageradio.com reported about a listening session they had they attended for the new album and they weren't played the whole album they were played uh, five tracks and um and they were rough mixes too they were rough mixes so yeah nothing's finished yet and uh there wasn't a whole lot of information there there wasn't any individual descriptions on the songs there was a an overall label that this is Paul's best work since the late 70s but that kind of that's Paul's manager saying that. Right. That's a yeah, and and but right, and but uh, there really wasn't a whole lot of information to go on. But I guess the biggest piece of information is that there's four producers. Well, and we've known that for a while. No, I don't think so. Uh, I uh, uh, I don't recall Epworth and and uh, Epworth's name before. Paul Epworth, Mark Ronson. I knew Ronson and Giles and and John and heard Johns, but I don't recall. I, can, I don't recall Epworth's name. If you recall it, then you got something over me because no, I've seen it mentioned. You have? Yeah, I have. Okay. But okay. Um, it does say in the article that there are 21 songs that Paul has recorded, and um, it might be coming out. It's likely to be coming out. That's in what October. it says uh, in October, right? Mm-hmm. So. Wishful thinking. You know, I, I really hope that it's true that it will be coming out in October. I know from so many years of doing news on the air how many times projects uh, get delayed, many times over. There's no way to tell how long, you know, how that's going to work out. Um, but we will see. That'll be interesting. There's, uh, I mean, there's no title to the album, so there's, there's right. nothing to, to go at this point. It's kind of like throwing something out in thin air and saying, "Yeah, it's going to happen." And you know, but but this guy from the website was saying that um, there were no titles given. Right. The title of the album wasn't given, and from what he had heard from those five songs, it was reminiscent of a few titles that he threw out. Penny Lane being one of them, "Come and Get It," another, and "Free as a Bird," which which I found. was interesting on itself because yeah. "Free as a Bird" obviously is a Lennon song and. He was talking about McCartney's contributions to Free as a Bird, so interesting. So let's hope that that's true. We've been hearing for a while now that Paul's been recording new music. Right. So, um, you know, it's been a long wait for the last album since, uh, well, Electric Arguments, as far as all original material, not counting Kisses on the Bottom. So it's it's really been quite a while since Paul's given us... Yeah, it has, and everybody... 
is hanging on to this one with with bated breath and you know anxious ears and all that stuff. So, well, I'm craving it. Believe me, it's been a long time. Like I said, you're not you, alone. Yeah, you're not alone. Judging by the number of hits that st- that story I wrote today has already grabbed, um, a lot of people are waiting for any kind of information they can get. So, you know, there once was a time when certainly in the 70s, and throughout most of the 80s, Paul released something every single year of new material, whether it was an album or just a single. You know, so he was as productive as can be. And so when you have long waits, and I know there have been times when there have been like two to three years in between albums, when that started to happen, like uh, Press to Play and Flowers in the Dirt, there were like two to three years there in between. Although the Russian album was in between that. But then between Flowers in the Dirt and Off the Ground, you've got four years there. Although you've got the classical music <laughs> in mm-hmm. between. But I'm saying as far as pop albums are concerned, of all original, you know, this is quite a while yep. since the last one. So what did you want to talk about next, Steve? Why don't we go, why don't we um, do Howlett? All right, well, Kevin Howlett, who we've known for quite a long time, has written a number of Beatle books, put out one... Back in the 80s for uh, BBC recordings, Live at the BBC, I think it was called. or Beatles at the 82. B- mm-hmm. 82, yeah. And that was a, a thin paperback for me with a lot of useful information about uh, the Beatles recordings for the Beeb. And he's got a really nice book coming out, ironically, on October 29th. On October which is... 29th, the same day the Mark Lewison book comes out. And I've seen a chapter from it, and uh, it has transcripts, it has pictures. It has document, BBC documents, so it's going to be a it's going to be a complete historical uh, uh, volume of of the, the BBC recordings. There's been rumors, and, and I wish I could say I had more information that something's going to happen. That Capital's going to do something. I suspect, as you suggested, Ken, before we went on the air, that they're going to go digital with the, with the BBC stuff, and that would make perfect sense. What would be really nice is if they would re- release more. That would be really nice, but personally, I'm not sure that they'll do that. But you know. If you go by what Capital's been doing in recent years, everything has been digital. They haven't put out CDs. Right. So, you know, making all the BBC tracks that were on Live at the BBC available would be wise. It would also be wise to put the bonus tracks that were on CD singles that were BBC recordings on there, too. Sure. If you remember, I'll Follow the Sun was one of them, Devil in Her Heart. They can add those on as bonus tracks. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that, that would be nice, too. Uh, I mean, the thing is, though, that as every Beatles fan knows, there's three tons of BBC stuff out there that didn't make the Capitol set. That's right. And uh, uh, Great Dane, uh, notably, had uh, a whole stack of BBC C- CDs, um, there's been internet only releases of every of complete quote quote complete BBC stuff that people have dredged up from God knows where. So there's a whole ton of BBC stuff of different versions of the same songs, obviously mm-hmm. that never got put out that they could draw from. There's no way, given especially given the economic situation now, I don't think that the Be- that the Beatles would put out the whole thing. I would be surprised. And, I, and no. there's also, you know, clearances and stuff to, to deal with, too. But It would be nice if they just gave us some new material that wasn't on Live at the BBC before. Yeah. Even though it's been bootlegged. Right. You know, right. There, it would be. And they, they could clean it up. I mean, um, I know there's been criticism. Uh, there was criticism after Live at the BBC came out about the sound quality of the capital version versus, versus some of the bootlegs and blah, blah, blah. And, you know... Um, we can go on that one all day long, but yeah, it'd be great to have some of that, some more of that stuff out again. Mm-hmm. And Absolutely. Uh, so, and so the, you know, you've got the the Kevin Howlett BBC book, you've got the possible whatever Capital's going to do with the BBC releases. There's a couple of other interesting books coming out. There's uh, Chuck Gunderson's book on the Beatles U.S. tours. And now, I've, what what? Are we going to learn about these tours that we haven't already? Is this going to be a more thorough, exhaustive look at the, the three U.S. tours? Yes. I've, I've been in contact with Chuck Gunderson this week, and he, yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a detailed look on each spot.
spot on the tour. Uh, he's going to go city by city, year by year, and uh, according to the, the the advanced stuff that I got to see, and go through you know everything that happened in the in the cities and uh, you know the atmosphere and everything like that. One of the things I asked him in the interview that I just finished conducting uh, yesterday was uh, what was the most significant thing you learned? And he said how lucky each city was to get the Beatles and the roles that the stations and the record stores played in getting the Beatles to get to be there. Mm. So that's, yeah, that's very interesting. Um, and um, so, and I, I'm going to, I have a, an inter- a short interview with Chuck that I'm, I'm going to put together um, that'll talk about some of the information in the book, and that'll be on the Beatles Examiner site. And we should try to get him on our show. We should. We we very much should, and uh, and I think I've posed that question to him. But if I haven't, I would definitely will. In addition to all that, you've got David Bedford's book coming out, right? Fab One Hundred Four. Got that book coming out, uh, sequel to his his great Liddy Pool book, which I thought was one of the best books I'd ever I'd ever seen. That was was absolutely fantastic. I really, everything that. you'd ever want to know about Liverpool and Liverpool sites, you know, the history of of the city. That's the book to go to. Yeah, it really, it really, he did a great job. Um, Kevin Roach has got another book coming out. He's done three books on the Beatles now. He's done a, a you know, an overview book on the Beatles, and plus he did books on the ba- the family backgrounds of John and Paul, and now he's got a George book coming out. It's as good as the others. It's as in depth and as thorough as the other books, and um, so that's going to be. That's going to be very interesting too, um, and and there's Lawrence Juber, and there's Lawrence Juber. Can't for, can't forget Lawrence Juber, and that's going to be interesting. Uh, I have not seen any part of the Lawrence Juber book, and I don't know that that he hasn't really talked too much about it. Uh, he probably will, uh, you know. He, I'm sure he will soon, and we'll hear more he's, about that. But that looks to be interesting from what I hear. He's he's a great interview. Yes, he is. You know, he tells you a lot about that time with Paul. Yes, but this he does. this book and is about he, his whole yeah, life, though. And, you know, he's um, yeah. I mean, he was in he was in there at an interesting time. Let's put let's say that with a little bit of yeah, but yeah. And so that's going to be a, a very interesting book too. And then we have the possibility that Let It Be might be showing up on DVD, and that's just a guess. There's nothing to go on, but. Well, it, it the comments are starting to the chatter is starting to to uh, rise if I can if we can say use that word in this context and um, the fact that somebody asked Ringo about it in Los Angeles uh, a few weeks ago when when I was down there and and Ringo kind of hemmed and hawed and didn't say no and uh, yeah you know, Paul so, was asked about and, it too uh, I'm sorry Paul was asked about it too Paul was recently. Asked about it too. And neither of them have denied it. Well, I have no doubt that it's going to come out. The question is when. Yeah, I'm think I'm my, I have this feeling, and it's just a feeling, and I don't have any, you know, it's just it, things are starting to point to this year. Uh, I don't know that that's really going to happen, but. Well, the only thing I would question about that is, and maybe this doesn't even matter anymore, but there used to be a time when you wouldn't put out two products at the same time to compete with each other. And if Paul's album, if, if it's coming out in October, is it wise to put out Let It Be around the same time? Because and that Ringo's, could end up... Ringo's got one too, though. Yeah, but Ringo hasn't said that album's finished. He no, just said he's working be. on a new album. Yeah, he's been working on it for a while, and, and I haven't seen any, I don't recall any indication of exactly when that's going to happen. Uh-huh. Well, the last two albums, he's released the early part of the year, like in January. Right. Which... There is a theory that it's smart to do that because there's less competition. <laughs> there are very few releases that come out the first quarter of the year. You know, mm-hmm. everything points towards the Christmas market, and then the first few months of the new year, there's very little that comes out. So maybe a little more attention can be devoted to the new releases at that time, even though yeah. it hasn't mattered in the sales of Ringo's albums. But I'm just saying that the la- if you follow what Ringo's done the last few years... Uh, Ringo 2012, why not? They came out very early in the years. So that's that's also depending on whether or not he's really done with it. That's true. And, uh, I mean, what you're saying makes 
a whole lot of sense in in what he has done in the past. So it could very well go that route. But I just don't know at this point if it even matters anymore whether a Beatle product comes out the same time as a solo product, or would they be watching that and trying to make sure that the sales don't get hurt by you know the Beatles overshadowing the solo? Beatle products are such an event, no matter what they are. No matter, well, and I, let's pull back on that slightly. Things like Tomorrow Never Knows was not considered an event, but... That happened rather suddenly, too. <laughs> it happened suddenly, and it really wasn't... It was kind of a... That was kind of almost a test, it seems, you know, because it was the first thing they had done. Like, it was it was a rare occurrence to put out a digital-only album to, you know, for something that they, you know, they hadn't done before like that. Um, but I don't know, but... Uh, See, I don't you know. know if all the remastered movies that have come out have been that big an event, especially when you consider Yellow Submarine and Magical Mystery Tour coming out the same year. Not that it came out quietly, but it wasn't this huge splash, you know? Mm -hmm. I, thought, I, mean, I thought Help was help kind of got a little buried. It really didn't make the big splash, only because Help was already out there. Right. Yellow Submarine made a little more impact because because uh, it hadn't been out there for so long, it had been out of print. It's too bad that uh, A Hard Day's Night, the Blu-ray of that, um, kind of really got buried, that nobody, um, you know, unless you really knew about it, isn't, for one, it isn't in the stores. I mean, you have to go online really to, to get it. Um, and I didn't particularly think the, the Blu-ray was all that special anyway. Yeah, but like like we're saying here, the movies haven't made that big a splash. The last time I think there was a big splash on the group would have been when the CDs came out remastered and Rock Band came out in mm -hmm. 2009, and also when, when their music was available digitally for the first time. Mm -hmm. You know, I haven't really seen something really major on them take let up it, a lot of, of uh, media attention. But let it be media will. media attention for several reasons. Number one, it hasn't been out there. Number two... Because everybody likes a little bit of conflict, that's what this has. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of tension. There was a lot of tension around it, and that's going to get, you know, everybody's going to want to see that again, especially since they haven't seen it for so long. Yeah, well, Never there's... mind that Let It Be wasn't, the, you know, in the string of Beatle movies, it was not what you'd call the, the greatest movie. You know, it's not a... It's not a hard day. It's not, it's not the masterpiece it's a hard day. It's a different favorite. type of movie, Steve. You True. can't make a I, comparison. No, no, no. I, I completely agree with you, but it's very, it's, it, you know, it is what it is. It's a documentary. It's a, do yeah. It's the Beatles as they were. Mm -hmm. Whether or not you want to call it watching them disintegrate as a band, you know, at times they do have fun in the studio, but, you know, it's, it's a fascinating film to watch. And, and one, the performances of the, one of are the great. interesting things will be whether the remastered version really changes the focus of what the film is. Because uh, in an interview I did with someone who had seen the remastered version, they said, you know, to see the film not grainy and to see it really sharp really puts a different, uh, different focus on the film. It becomes a lot more positive. Than it, real, than it was. And that's going to be interesting to, to see. Well, I'm sure it's going to happen. It's just a question of when. Just a question of when. Who knows? All right. This has been fun. I'm Ken Michaels. For things we said today, thanking all of you for listening. And we'll see you next time. And this is Steve Marinucci saying we had a lot of things to say today. And we will see you next time. <laughs>